Thank you. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Jan Hubička and uh, I'm working on, uh, on GCC for, uh, for SUSE. And so this talk is going to be a bit about GCC and it's a joint talk with uh, Martin Liška, which is here. So in about 10 minutes before the end of the talk, he will punch me and start speaking instead of me. So don't be surprised. Let's prepare. Okay, so uh, I would like to say something about uh, uh, link time optimizations, and I would like to try to convince you that it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to try out. And so the, in the first part of the talk, I will simply explain what the, what the link time optimization is, and then I will spend some time uh, showing you some benchmarks. And then uh, we will try to discuss you know, if uh, the open source can be one of the first distributions which are built by LTO, maybe the first one, because I don't know an, about another one. So, Let's start about, uh, about the link time optimization. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the usual compilation model of, of the C compilers, which is uh, starting from, from 70s. And in this model, you, know, you run the compiler on every single source file, and you produce the object files, which are uh, containing the final binary or final assembler output. And then you use the linker, which just glues it together, and you get your binary, which is uh, cool because it's fast, and you can distribute uh, the build process, but it's also limiting the compiler in the, in the quantity of optimizations it can do, because it doesn't know what the other objects are doing. It only sees the part of the program. So uh, the link time optimization is something which is uh, uh, being introduced since 80s, and it means that uh, you compile uh, the source files into the object files, but this time the object file is not containing the final assembly, but it contains intermediate language. So that's what the IL stands for. And then, you know, this kind of fake object files, you know, they are no longer real object files, they are put into the linker, and the linker doesn't know what to do with it because it doesn't understand them. So that's why there is a linker plugin, so the LTO plugin, and the LTO plugin tells the linker that uh, the object files are actually used by, uh, by the compiler, and it dispatches back to the compiler, which is the link time compiler. And the link time compiler takes all the object files at once, and uh, it produces uh, the final binary, which is fed back to the linker, and the linker pretends it did, did all the job at itself. So this is, uh, this is the basic scheme. And you can see that the LTO is kind of a change into the wall uh, tool chain. It's not only changing the compiler, but you need to change also the linker and the R and all the other tools which are holding your object files because uh, all of them has to understand that from now on, the object files can be the real object files, but they also can be the fake, uh, fake object files. And uh, why we would we do this? You know, it's a lot of work. And uh, the basically, uh, the reason why we do that is uh, to, get, uh, to get a better code quality. So if you have the link time optimizer, you know much more than you know on the compile time. So the first important thing is that the linker tells you which objects, uh, which symbols are used only by, uh, by the code you see, and which symbols are used by shared libraries or uh, binded somehow externally. So basically, you can optimize a lot more because you can somehow pretend that most of the functions in the program are static, and you can change them. And also, you can do the cross-module inlining, which is good because uh, normally you have to put a lot of code into your headers. That makes the programs more ugly to read and longer to compile. And uh, this way, you can do it somehow transparently behind the uh, user's back. And also, the uh, unreachable code removal is quite important because if you see the whole program, you see that not everything is being used. Uh, and there are some other more things like uh, the exception handling optimization, which means that you can show in C++ programs that a lot of functions are not throwing, and you can remove a lot of exception handling uh, information and cleanups. And you can also fold the identical code, and you can optimize for the code layout. So this is the basic list of the optimizations which you can do. And there are also problems. So one of the problems is that uh, you need to change the world to chain. Uh, the other problem is that the compilers are much slower than linkers because they do much more work. And each time you change a single file, you, know, you have to do all the compilation work again, which takes a lot of time. And the next thing, which is a problem, especially for us, is that the back reports become harder. 
because if your program doesn't work, you cannot just take the single object file and source code and send it to the bugzilla. You know, basically you get the bug reports like Linux kernel is broken if I compile this version with this version of GCC, and I don't know how to reduce it further. So this is quite a hell, and uh, it's uh, it's an important problem. And also, uh, it's not completely uh, transparent to the users. So uh, most of the time, you can add LTO into your command line, and you get the LTO, and it works. But it doesn't work in complex uh, scenarios. Like if you do the Linux kernel, you know you need to do some extra work to actually get LTO working. So this is uh, the quick review of uh, what LTO is. And uh, I will speak a little bit more about how GCC uh, has uh, become the link time optimizing compiler. So there is actually quite a long history of the LTO work. The LTO work started in the 90s. And basically in the 90s, the GCC was a compiler which was organized in the way that it was compiling every statement from the source code into the intermediate language. And then as soon as possible, it was producing the assembly, which was necessarily in the 90s, because in the 80s, there was not enough memory to hold the program or even the single compilation unit in, uh, uh, in uh, memory. So at that time, it makes sense, but it didn't make sense at the back of 90s. So from then, you know, we started to work on the high-level optimizations. So uh, it was done by different uh, companies, like the new inliner was contributed by Kosovsere, the unit at the time. I remember it was done by SUSE because I started it, I think, on the first OpenSUSE or SUSE Labs conference because I was bored So during the talks. And uh, there was a new high-level optimization framework, which, is, uh, which was started in 2005. And at the, in 2010, it was basically done. So the basic LTO framework was uh, on, the, on the place, and it was able to compile some programs. But it was slow. And uh, that was solved in 2011 by adding a parallelization model for, uh, for LTO. So since 2011, we are basically able to build Firefox in the reasonable time. Like on my machine, it's about six minutes of linking time. And I don't know, six or seven gigs of memory, which is a lot, but it's also not that much. Uh, you need 10 gigs of memory to build Firefox in my setup anyway. So. Uh, how that works, you know. So this is the this is the traditional link time optimization model, and uh, the main problem is that most of the work is done in the link time compiler. The link time compiler can take a lot of time. You know, on Firefox, on my machine, it takes about 40 minutes to to finish its job, which is very boring. So uh, what GCC does is that uh, it's actually uh, adding a whole program analysis pass, which is the only only part which is done in in serial. And once we are done with the whole program uh, analysis, we are splitting up the program again into partitions, and every partition is compiled independently. So the compilation times are much faster because we are able to use uh, multiple CPUs, and theoretically we are also able to distribute the build, but we don't do that at, at the moment. So uh, this is slightly more complicated setup, but it gets you pr pretty much all the benefits of LTO uh, at, at more reasonable cost. So uh, this is how the story continues. So since 2012, we have the framework, which is able to compile big programs. But uh, it still needed a lot of work. And basically, the reason why I'm speaking here today is that in 2018, you know, which is this year, uh, we finished the debug info. So you, know, you can finally debug the output of the LTO compiler in a reasonable quality. So it's kind of comparable to the experience of uh, debugging optimized code without LTO, which is kind of important uh, if you want to uh, declare uh, the compiler to be production ready. So it was 18 years of work. And, uh, and uh, I will show you uh, how, uh, how that pays back. So this is the uh, kind of basic overview of how GCC works. Now GCC is containing the parser, and then it's containing a lot of optimization passes. There are about 300 of them, so I wasn't able to fit all of them on the slide. But I did fit a good part of it. And this is, uh, this is the split of the GCC compilation process. So the first bar, you know, the light green one, uh, that happens on the uh, on the compile time. So that's uh, relatively cheap because each time you change the single file, you, uh, you don't need to redo all the parsing and optimization of the all other source files. 
And also you can do it in parallel. You know, usually we build with, uh, with the parallel make. And uh, one of the design goals was to put as many as optimization as, uh, as you can into this early pass. So there is a kind of the set of the early optimizations which is doing the things which are kind of obvious or simple. So it's kind of close to what you do when you have a high quality JIT compiler like uh, in Firefox. Uh, so we do inlining, we do constant propagation, we do uh, all this kind of standard, uh, standard optimizations, which are win-win, you know, they don't uh, get the code to be worse. And at the end of this, uh, we, we stream out uh, the object files, and once uh, the linker uh, calls us back, by the linker plugin, we start with the serial part, which is the orange one. And we read all the program at once into the memory, but we don't read everything. We read only kind of summaries of what we have uh, written on the compile time. And on these summaries, we perform the interprocedural optimizations. So we do the difficult decisions like where to inline or uh, how, to, uh, how to clone the functions. And we don't do the actual work, we only make the decisions, and we partition the program, we stream, stream it out, which is here, and then, then the compilation part happens, which is parallel again. Uh, this is where you do most of the busy work, so there are kind of all the high-level optimizations of uh, loop optimizations and all the uh, kind of more difficult optimizations, which doesn't need to necessarily win. And we also have to redo most of the early optimizations because uh, uh, the program has changed by inlining. But the purpose of the early optimizations is that the program gets both smaller and it's also easier to optimize. So uh, the serial part, you know, the orange part, sees the program in the more realistic way than it would uh, if, uh, if the optimization didn't happen. So in the traditional uh, link time optimizers, you know, the error optimizations doesn't need to exist. And usually everything is done in the serial part. So the difference in the GCC and the traditional model is, is this additional, additional split of the compilation, uh, compilation process. Okay, so uh, I would like to speak a little bit about uh, how that pays back in the performance. Uh, let's see how I will do with the time. So this is, uh, this is a spec uh, uh, benchmark suite, which is kind of the standard way how you test the compiler performance. So every compiler developer knows what the spec is. There is a big committee uh, choosing the benchmarks for it, and the benchmarks are supposed to be somehow representative for, for the system performance. And uh, the bars, uh, the zero means uh, the same performance as GCC6. And uh, the numbers are in percent, you know, the speed up, so the bigger is better. Uh, so it's not completely honest because uh, I should have started on, on zero and made it 100%, but then you would see nothing on the bars because I wouldn't be able to show you there is a 1.5% difference in the performance. So, uh, so mind that the bars are not very realistic, uh, uh, you know, if they go up, but they, you know, the performance doesn't go up that much. So, uh, the first part of story is that, you know, if you want to get your program faster, you might try to update the compiler, and we do get better over the time, but the progress is relatively small, because we are optimizing for the similar set of benchmarks for 20 years, and we couldn't optimize for 15% every year, because the programs would be too fast. And so, and there is a green is the, is the generic tuning, and the orange is a tuning for a specific CPU, which in this case was the Ryzen. So you can see that the CPU tuning has improved because the Ryzen got into the market, but the generic tuning didn't improve that much. Okay, so this is uh, the other thing you can do, you know, you can decide that you will use the most aggressive optimization. So we have the OFAST option, which allows GCC to uh, get the bigger code, but it also uh, allows GCC to produce some operations which are not completely correct, like assume that all the numbers are numbers in floating point and not on numbers. And uh, here, you know, you can see that uh, we used to improve by about 2% over the, over the baseline, which means that, you know, the benchmark is really hard to optimize. It's supposed to be kind of system benchmark is memory bound, but we have improved a lot more in the GCC 8. But if you look on the, on the distribution of the single benchmarks, uh, there is only one benchmark which improves a lot. And uh, that's a benchmark which is uh, called Hammer. And it's, uh, it's optimized by a very, uh, very basic trick of interchanging two loops. So sometimes you, know, you can see the big jump, but it's coming from only a single benchmark, uh, which, which is somehow not representative in the geometric uh, average. 
Okay, so this is what you can expect from uh, from the from changing a compilation flags. You can also say that maybe you know GCC is too old and you can use different compiler. So this is the Clang and uh, and ICC. Now it's not completely fair to ICC because ICC doesn't tune for Zen, but you can see that the CPU tuning is pretty small. So it's uh, I think it's uh, representative enough. And again, you know you can see you know how how it compares to the GCC8. So basically, you can see that most of the bars are coming uh, below zero. So GCC is actually doing pretty well, you know, compared to the ICC benchmark uh, as well, which is uh, which is quite good, because ICC is uh, is a you know one of the reasons for ICC to exist is to get uh, the spec numbers to be good. Okay, so now you can try now you can try the LTO. And uh, here you can see that the LTO is adding something like uh, two extra percent of the performance. So it's basically the same as switching on OFAST uh, on the on the older compilers. And that's coming without uh, without sacrificing the code size and without uh, uh, without sacrificing the precision. And uh, just to show how that works for other compilers, you know, this is uh, how the LTO compares to the non-LTO. So you can see it's fairly, fairly uh, distributed. So you can expect that your average program will speed up a bit. And uh, overall, by by something like uh, one and a half percent. And this is. Uh, uh, what you can expect uh, from the other compilers. So the Clunk is also getting uh, some benefits from the LTO, which is uh, comparable to GCC LTO uh, compared to its baseline. And ICC is getting a lot more. Uh, the reason is that uh, the ICC has really a big team working on uh, on uh, specific optimizations for uh, for uh, this specific benchmark. So we know some of these uh, some of these optimizations where they are coming from. Uh, like in the Hammer, what they do is that they change uh, the memory representation of the matrix. So instead of exchanging the loops, you change uh, change the memory representation, which is something which ECC simply doesn't go because it's somehow considered to be uh, specific to the benchmarking uh, tricks, you know, we don't really know if uh, we can do it in the way it would be uh, it would be reasonable for uh, for real world programs. So, uh, but uh, but the conclusion definitely is that while we don't have much uh, space to grow for uh, for the parallel compression project because we are pretty much on the state of the art, you know, there is uh, there is still space to grow for uh, for uh, LTO compilation. Okay, so this is uh, another thing which you can do to help uh, to help your performance, and that's to use the profile feedback. So I'm not sure how many of you knows what profile feedback is, but basically you can use the option profile generate to GCC, and then you can run your application, and then GCC can use the data which are collected uh, to optimize the application better. And uh, profile feedback is uh, kind of orthogonal to LTO because in LTO, you know, the compiler has a lot of options what to do, but it doesn't know what to do because it doesn't understand the program very well. If you have the profile feedback, you know, the profile feedback tells you, you know, which parts of the program are important, you know, how many times the loops are iterating, uh, which functions to inline. So together, you can get pretty big uh, speed ups. And the speed ups can be pretty real, you know. Like if you look on the parallel benchmark, which is parallel, of course, you can get something between 17 to 27, 23 percent improvement, which is uh, noticeable in GCC. You get something like 7 percent improvement. So that that really translates to numbers, which uh, which relatively matters. And you can see that you know the LTO and FDO together is getting something like 7 percent improvement overall, which is uh, pretty large. Compared to the something like no 1.5 percent or 2 percent for LTO or FDO alone, so if you compare these two optimizations together, uh, you get much better result than uh, than if you do just one alone. And this is uh, a quick uh, slide on the code size. So you can see that in GCC, you know, the LTO is actually decreasing the code size, which is one of the goals. You know, if you want to build your system, you want to make the system small, not bigger. Uh, that's different with ICC or Clank. You know, the, the LTO is uh, increasing the code size because maybe it's not tuned for this uh, for this goal. And also, you can see that the profile feedback is getting the binary slightly smaller than uh, than uh, result. So this is you know how how things looks like on the on on the benchmarks. 
Uh, if, you, if you look, and I will skip this one because I don't have time, but if you look on the real programs, uh, the situations are different because the real programs are much bigger than benchmarks. You know, the Firefox is uh, a lot bigger than, than the biggest program in, in the spec test suite because the GCC in the spec test suite is quite big, but it's old, so it's still relatively small. And uh, these numbers was collected by the Firefox people because they tried the LTO in their official benchmarking server. They have pretty cool benchmarking architecture. And you can see that they measured that uh, uh, you can improve uh, responsiv responsiveness of the page rendering by, by almost 20% or 30% percent with, uh, with uh, without the profile feedback, and also some of the other important benchmarks improve noticeably, like Dromayo is a, is a JavaScript benchmark, which was tuned for by them for a long time, and Top Paint is a uh, top painting, there is a startup time on the very end. So a lot of uh, real world benchmarks are improving uh, by, by uh, this optimization. And I like, you know, they have this way of, uh, of testing the performance. So the orange is the bench baseline of, of the Firefox. And uh, the uh, violet, or I don't know, blue dots, you know, I'm guy. So the blue dots are, uh, are the various experiments, you know, which someone has tried to do a benchmark. And here, you know, you can see the, the benchmark for enabling LTO. So basically, in, in one year of the Firefox development, this was the most, uh, uh, most successful uh, performance improvement uh, they tried. But they are still not brave, brave enough to enable it by default, which we will do, hopefully. And this is, uh, you know, that's uh, also kind of interesting to me, you know, that's the responsiveness uh, test. So you can see it's much more noisy. And if you see the history, you can see that the improvement is pretty good, you know, it's the time, so you know, going down is better than, so it's this, this bar, going down is better than going up. But uh, in, the, in the big scale, you know, they was able to get, uh, get a similar improvements otherwise. Okay, and this is uh, just uh, to quickly summarize, you know, how the code size works. So, you know, of course, that's something which is not important for specs because the programs are relatively small, but for Firefox it is. So you can see that uh, the binaries are slightly getting smaller, you know, over the GCC releases because uh, we are looking into that. And you can also see that the different optimization levels are making significantly different binaries. So the O3 is very large, you know, and, uh, and OS is uh, about the half of the code size of the O3. And you can see that the FDO, you know, the profile feedback is making the binary significantly smaller because, you know, a huge part of the Firefox is actually that it's not being tested by the profile run, so it's not uh, optimized for, uh, for speed. And uh, this is, you know, how it goes with the LTO. So the LTO gets really quite big improvements on the, on the size, and basically it goes one step down. So, you know, the O3 with LTO is faster than, than O3 without LTO, but it's also smaller than O2. So the binaries are really uh, improving in the size. And this is just to see you know, how Clunk works. So you know, they have O2 comparable to our O2, but their O3 is smaller and their profile feedback is uh, again uh, not optimizing for size. And uh, the LTO is also not optimizing for size. It's the same story as uh, for, uh, for uh, specs. So that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, for, the, for the performance part. So to summarize, you know, the LTO now works and it can build the big programs like Firefox. Actually, LibreOffice is built by default uh, with LTO in the, in the open source now. So that's why I'm projecting from Acrobat because I'm not sure it will not crash during the presentation. And uh, it's a very, uh, I think it's pretty successful size optimization because you can almost always see the size improvements. Uh, and uh, the performance improvements, it really depends on the type of your application, if they matter to you or not. But, uh, but often they also do. And there's a lot of space for the future improvements because uh, you can improve GCC, but you can also re-optimize the applications for LTO. So, you know, if, if we enable it, slowly things will, will move to, to the overall better performance. And that's the end of my part. And uh, Martin will tell you, you know, how that works with Open Source Factory. So, uh, I have a couple of slides about uh, LDO and factory. Uh, what we did, we basically took a normal staging project. Uh, we modified project config where we added dash FLTO to OptFlex. Now that recently we added uh, 
position independent execution by default in the distribution, which means these options should be really used by every single package. Uh, the number of failures is quite surprising. It's only 80 packages of more than 2,000. Uh, the packages consist of all the KDE, GNOME, and uh, base system. And uh, to be able to test the staging project in OpenQA, we had to basically disable LTO for packages which fail. And then we are able to get a distribution which is close to LTO distribution. So, uh, next step was to boot uh, the ISO image which we got uh, in, in KVM. And I basically find all the ELF executables and shared libraries, which is close to 7,000. And uh, the total size of these files reduced from almost 2 gigs by about uh, 5%. Note that this is also including packages which were built without LTO, so the real number should be better, I guess. Okay. And uh, I have a couple of examples. The first one is uh, the main library of LibreOffice, which reduced by 16%, which is quite significant. And we have also examples of uh, some MySQL uh, binaries, which reduced really significantly, but it's due to usage of just the limited amount of code. So, uh, we were able to boot it in OpenQA, and it, it was able to success the tests, except some fallout, which was quite small, I guess. And uh, there are some issues. Uh, the packages which failed, uh, failed for various reasons, and I will go through the issues uh, we've seen. The first two are some limitations in GCC. The first one was, uh, was a bailout when we uh, basically rejected two symbols being defined in, uh, or being prevailing in two libraries, which is a valid situation if you use uh, no common option. The second was a real miscompilation where we decided to merge two declarations of functions. One was having attribute no return. Uh, and the two declarations had the same assembly name, so it was a real issue. Uh, the third one, it's uh, the reason why most of the shared libraries failed. It's, uh, it's a symbol versioning for shared libraries where you can uh, where you can have versions of interface of functions which you export, and it allows you to run executable, which is dy dynamically linked with a newer version of library, but still using uh, some old interface, which is quite a nice feature, but uh, we will have to add a new function attribute for next GCC release. Uh, yeah, static libraries. So in general, we should not ship uh, static libraries in uh, other packages. There are obvious exceptions like uh, some error recovery tools for file systems, for instance. And uh, what, you, what we have to do, we probably have to enable so-called FET LTO objects, which are object files uh, which consist of both assembly language and uh, LTO IL. And at the end of build of a package, we basically have to strip all the LTO bytecode and we have to verify that we do not ship it. What's good about it is it's, uh, that even if you have a package which you want to be built with LTO and is linked with a static library, it's possible because LTO can transparently mix LTO objects and assembly objects. So. Uh, yeah, we have some special LTO warnings done by Honza. Uh, the first two examples, uh, this is this is issue. The first one I looked inside, and it's uh, it's issue where you have a structure being defined in a header file, and it has conditional fields based on some macro. And if you if you forget to include for instance, conf config header file in a, in a translation unit, then you end up with a 
with the two translation units having a different layout of a structure, which, which can cause yeah, failures because of the size of is different and the binary. Yeah, so the layout in memory is different. Uh, then we have some legacy configure scripts, which do grabbing of uh, object files, which uh, is not possible if you if you use LTO, you have LTO IL in the object files, so you can't grab for a format of floating point, for instance. So it's quite rare, I would say. Uh, then we have uh, this tool, DVZ, DWZ. Uh, it sh it's, a, it's a dwarf compression tool, which is... Uh, which is being developed by uh, Jakub Bielinek from Red Hat, and it, it looks he's not have enough time to enhance it to fully support uh, LTO, so it's definitely what we need to work on. And maybe we'll see some higher memory constraints uh, for for a couple of packages like LibreOffice and etc. We'll see. And last issue I have, it's it's quite similar to a symbol versioning. It's usage of top-level assembly. Uh, as you can see in the example, there is a function being defined in assembly, which is just string for GCC. And uh, the LTO failure, which you can see on the bottom, is caused by a caller of the function is in a different translation unit in uh, LTO so that it can't find a symbol. It's quite easy to fix. You basically add no LTO to uh, the translation units which use these top level symbols. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the last slide of the talk, actually. It presents a histogram of text segments of packages. And it basically tells the most of the packages are smaller and a few of them are big, bigger. The biggest uh, size improvement is seen on uh, executables, and uh, the smaller is on shared libraries, which provide quite some exported sim symbols. And uh, conclusion, and uh, so the conclusion of the talk is basically whether we want to have it in uh, OpenSUSE factory being enabled by default. We hope it's we hope LTO and GCC is mature enough to do it. And uh, yeah, as Onza, as Onza mentioned, we can be the first distribution, which eventually will maybe one day appear in a SLI as well. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? So if you create the profile for your application uh, for compilation, uh, how probable is that it won't work when you start using a um, newer version of GCC? Uh, well, at the moment, the profile is specific to, to the configuration and to the GCC. So the idea is that we have to train it uh, during the package build. And uh, the way it works is that uh, in, in many cases, like in the Python or parallel, you know, we can simply run the test suite or do something like that. So in the Firefox case, it's slightly more uh, challenging. So what they do is that they simply start the Firefox, they cycle it through some pages, and they have a, they have a make file machinery for that. So you, you need to open your web server, which can be VNC, so you don't need to really see it, and it does the, that's all the training each time you build it. Okay, thank you. So uh, you built the whole distribution with LTO. Uh, he did. <laughs> so uh, how much longer it takes now? Actually, I, I haven't measured it, but uh, there will be some increase, but I would expect just a small one. So the overhead would be mm -hmm. quite small, I guess. Yeah. So like 10%, or like 10 times, or like 
Uh, no, it's uh, for, it depends, of course, on the on the package. But if I remember correctly, it was something like 16 percent for LibreOffice. So that's uh, and you know, bigger packages are harder. You know, the smaller packages are easier. So I would say the average should be better. But for example, GCC itself is terrible because it has a static library which is called libbackend, which is very big. It links it into every single language it supports. So the GCC bootstrap gets much slower without EO. So it really depends on how, how the program is structured. Two questions. Have you done any testings on architectures other than x86-64? And since you mentioned the sleeve for the future, does this impact our ability to do live patching? So the first question is no. We just I just used OpenQA for x86-64. And the second question, we, def we probably don't want to have it in a Linux kernel. Currently you need uh, a huge patch set on top of Linux kernel to be able to build, build with LTO and it's not upstreamed. It's Undeclean is working on that and uh, he was rejected a couple of times by Linux to merge the patch set. So. Yeah, actually, yeah, no, the, the LTO support in Linux kernel is interesting because for us, because it uh, really trains a lot of strange cases with GCC needs to deal. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the benefits are not, not as uh, large because uh, it's heavily hand optimized, you know, carefully, carefully handled code base. You now, the benefits are much bigger on things like LibreOffice, which is huge and has much more abstraction penalty. So, yeah, you know, there are some, some packages like glibc, which I don't expect we want to have LTO at all. Uh, so, and also, you know, for the x86 question, uh, we, don't, we didn't do the open source test, but of course the performance and spec benchmarking is done by, by ARM and IBM, so they are also tracking the LTO performance. The GCC code for, for all those um, LTO handling, is that generic code or are there architecture specific bits so that like uh, say the, power might be, mm -hmm. the, the benefits might not be as large as now for, for yeah. Intel where no, most technically people are testing. The only, only architecture specific part is how you pick it into the object files. So you need to understand the object files. So there's a different support for Mac, different for Windows and different for, for ELF. But besides that it's, it's a generic. So it goes for all the, uh, all the targets. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the increase in the, uh, due to this um, IL mm -hmm. code being added to the individual object files? Would that um, be noticeable in uh, you know, some packages having constraints for the disk sizes in OBS? Yeah, they are, they are generally bigger. Except for something big. Yeah, yeah, they are not 10 times bigger, but they, they, they are somehow bigger than, than the usual, usual object files because, uh, because they contain more information. Uh, but on the other hand, we are compressing them, so they are compressed, so they, they take, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also, also, yeah, that's something we are working on. You know, we are trying to reduce the quantity of information we are streaming because it's an important uh, performance bottleneck. So, yeah. Uh, I don't remember the numbers, but it's not twice, it's, it's you know, some percent bigger. So I guess it's time for beers. Thank you. <laughs>